Srimad Bhagavad Gita, Chapter 2 Contents of the Gita Summarized Sanjaya said, Seeing Arjuna full of compassion, his mind depressed, his eyes full of tears, Madhusudana, Krishna, spoke the following words. The Supreme Personality of Godhead said, My dear Arjuna, how have these impurities come upon you? They are not at all befitting a man who knows the value of life. They lead not to higher planets, but to infamy. O son of Prutha, do not yield to this degrading impotence. It does not become you. Give up such petty weakness of heart and arise, O chastiser of the enemy. Arjuna said, O killer of enemies, O killer of Madhu, how can I counter-attack with arrows in battle men like Bhishma and Drona who are worthy of my worship? It would be better to live in this world by begging than to live at the cost of the lives of great souls who are my teachers. Even though desiring worldly gain, they are superiors. If they are killed, everything we enjoy will be tainted with blood. Nor do we know which is better, conquering them or being conquered by them. If we killed the sons of Dhritarashtra, we should not care to live, yet they are now standing before us on the battlefield. Now I am confused about my duty and have lost all composure because of miserly weakness. In this condition I am asking you to tell me for certain what is best for me. Now I am your disciple and a soul surrendered unto you. Please instruct me. I can find no means to drive away this grief which is drying up my senses. I will not be able to dispel it even if I win a prosperous unrivaled kingdom on earth with sovereignty like the devas in heaven. Sanjaya said, Having spoken thus, Arjuna, chastiser of enemies, told Krishna, Govinda, I shall not fight, and fell silent. O descendant of Bharata, at that time Krishna, smiling in the midst of both the armies, spoke the following words to the grief-stricken Arjuna. The Supreme Personality of Godhead said, While speaking learned words, you are mourning for what is not worthy of grief. Those who are wise lament neither for the living nor for the dead. Never was there a time when I did not exist, nor you, nor all these kings, nor in the future shall any of us cease to be. As the embodied soul continuously passes in this body from boyhood to youth to old age, the soul similarly passes into another body at death. A sober person is not bewildered by such a change. O son of Kunti, the non-permanent appearance of happiness and distress and their disappearance in due cause are like the appearance and disappearance of winter and summer seasons. They arise from sense perception, O scion of Bharata, and one must learn to tolerate them without being disturbed. O best among men, Arjuna, the person who is not disturbed by happiness and distress and is steady in both is certainly eligible for liberation. Those who are seers of the truth have concluded that of the non-existent, the material body, there is no endurance, and of the eternal, the soul, there is no change. This they have concluded by studying the nature of both. That which pervades the entire body you should know to be indestructible. No one is able to destroy that imperishable soul. The material body of the indestructible, immeasurable and eternal living entity is sure to come to an end. Therefore fight, O descendant of Bharata. Neither he who thinks the living entity the slayer nor he who thinks it slain is in knowledge, for the self slays not, nor is slain. For the soul there is neither birth nor death at any time. He has not come into being, 
does not come into being and will not come into being. He is unborn, eternal, ever existing and primeval. He is not slain when the body is slain. O Partha, how can a person who knows that the soul is indestructible, eternal, unborn and immutable kill anyone or cause anyone to kill? As a person puts on new garments, giving up old ones, the soul similarly accepts new material bodies, giving up the old and useless ones. The soul can never be cut to pieces by any weapon, nor burned by fire, nor moistened by water, nor withered by the wind. This individual soul is unbreakable and insoluble and can be neither burned nor dried. He is everlasting, present everywhere, unchangeable, immovable and eternally the same. It is said that the soul is invisible, inconceivable and immutable. Knowing this, you should not grieve for the body. If, however, you think that the soul or the symptoms of life is always born and dies forever, you still have no reason to lament, O mighty armed. One who has taken his birth is sure to die, and after death one is sure to take birth again. Therefore, in the unavoidable discharge of your duty, you should not lament. All created beings are unmanifest in their beginning, manifest in their interim state, and unmanifest again when annihilated. So what need is there for lamentation? Some look on the soul as amazing, some describe him as amazing, and some hear of him as amazing, while others, even after hearing about him, cannot understand him at all. O descendant of Bharata, he who dwells in the body can never be slain. Therefore, you need not grieve for any living being. Considering your specific duty as a Kshatriya, you should know that there is no better engagement for you than fighting on religious principles, and so there is no need for hesitation. O Partha, happy are the Kshatriyas to whom such fighting opportunities come unsought, opening for them the doors of the heavenly planets. If, however, you do not perform your religious duty of fighting, then you will certainly incur sins for neglecting your duties, and thus lose your reputation as a fighter. People will always speak of your infamy and for a respectable person, dishonor is worse than death. The great generals who have highly esteemed your name and fame will think that you have left the battlefield out of fear only and thus they will consider you insignificant. Your enemies will describe you in many unkind words and scorn your ability. What could be more painful for you? O son of Kunti, either you will be killed on the battlefield and attain the heavenly planets or you will conquer and enjoy the earthly kingdom. Therefore get up with determination and fight. Do thou fight for the sake of fighting without considering happiness or distress, loss or gain, victory or defeat and by so doing you shall never incur sin. Thus far I have described this knowledge to you through analytical study. Now listen as I explain it in terms of working without fruitive results. O son of Pratha, when you act in such knowledge you can free yourself from the bondage of works. In this endeavor there is no loss or diminution and a little advancement on this path can protect one from the most dangerous type of fear. Those who are on this path are resolute in purpose and their aim is one. O beloved child of the Kurus, the intelligence of those who are irresolute is many-branched. Men of small knowledge are very much attached to the flowery words of the Vedas, which recommend various fruitive activities for elevation to heavenly planets, resultant good birth, power, and so forth. Being desirous of sense gratification and opulent life, they say that there is nothing more than this. 
in the minds of those who are too attached to sense enjoyment and material opulence and who are bewildered by such things, the resolute determination for devotional service to the Supreme Lord does not take place. The Vedas deal mainly with the subject of the three modes of material nature. O Arjuna, become transcendental to these three modes. Be free from all dualities and from all anxieties for gain and safety and be established in the self. All purposes served by a small well can at once be served by a great reservoir of water. Similarly, all the purposes of the Vedas can be served to one who knows the purpose behind them. You have a right to perform your prescribed duty, but you are not entitled to the fruits of action. Never consider yourself the cause of the results of your activities and never be attached to not doing your duty. Perform your duty equipoised, O Arjuna, abandoning all attachment to success or failure. Such equanimity is called yoga. O Dhananjaya, keep all abominable activities far distant by devotional service and in that consciousness surrender unto the Lord. Those who want to enjoy the fruits of their work are misers. A man engaged in devotional service a man engaged in devotional service rids himself of both good and bad actions even in this life. Therefore, strive for yoga, which is the art of all work. By thus engaging in devotional service to the Lord, great sages or devotees free themselves from the results of work in the material world. In this way, they become free from the cycle of birth and death and attain the state beyond all miseries by going back to Godhead. When your intelligence has passed out of the dense forest of delusion, you shall become indifferent to all that has been heard and all that is to be heard. When your mind is no longer disturbed by the flowery language of the Vedas and when it remains fixed in the trance of self-realization, then you will have attained the divine consciousness. Arjuna said, O oh Krishna, what are the symptoms of one whose consciousness is thus merged in transcendence? How does he speak? And what is his language? How does he sit? And how does he walk? The Supreme Personality of Godhead said, O Partha, when a man gives up all varieties of desire for sense gratification, which arise from mental concoction, and when his mind, thus purified, finds satisfaction in the self alone, then he is said to be in pure transcendental consciousness. One who is not disturbed in mind, even amidst the threefold miseries, nor elated when there is happiness, and who is free from attachment, fear and anger, is called a sage of steady mind. In the material world, one who is unaffected by whatever good or evil he may obtain, neither praising it nor despising it, is firmly fixed in perfect knowledge. One who is able to withdraw his senses from sense objects as the tortoise draws its limbs within the shell, is firmly fixed in perfect consciousness. The embodied soul may be restricted from sense enjoyment, though the taste for sense objects remain. By, se by seizing such engagements, sorry, let me read that again. The embodied soul may be restricted from sense enjoyment, though the taste for sense objects remains. But, Seizing such engagements by experiencing a higher taste, he is fixed in consciousness. The senses are so strong and impetuous, O Arjuna, that they forcibly carry away the mind even of a man of discrimination who is endeavouring to control them. One who restrains his senses, keeping them under full control, and fixes his consciousness upon me, is known as a man of steady intelligence. While contemplating the objects of the senses, a person develops attachment for them. 
And from such attachment, lust develops. And from lust, anger arises. From anger, complete delusion arises. And from delusion, bewilderment of memory. When memory is bewildered, intelligence is lost. And when intelligence is lost, one falls down again into the material pool. But a person free from all attachment and aversion and able to control his senses through regulative principles of freedom can obtain the complete mercy of the Lord. For one thus satisfied in Krishna consciousness, the threefold miseries of material existence exist no longer. In such satisfied consciousness, one's intelligence is soon well established. One who is not connected with the Supreme in Krishna consciousness can have neither transcendental intelligence nor a steady mind, without which there is no possibility of peace. And how can there be any happiness without peace? As a strong wind sweeps away a boat on the water, even one of the roaming senses on which the mind focuses can carry away a man's intelligence. Therefore, O oh mighty armed, one whose senses are restrained from their objects is certainly of steady intelligence. What is night for all beings is the time of awakening for the self-controlled, and the time of awakening for all beings is night for the introspective sage. A person who is not disturbed by the incessant flow of desires that enter like rivers into the ocean, which is ever being filled but is always still, can alone achieve peace, and not the man who strives to satisfy such desires. A person who has given up all desires for sense gratification, who lives free from desires, who has given up all sense of proprietorship and is devoid of false ego, he alone can attain real peace. That is the way of the spiritual and godly life, after attaining which a man is not bewildered. If one is thus situated, even at the hour of death, one can enter into the kingdom of God. Thus ends Sankhya Yoga, the second chapter of the perfect Upanishad and beautiful Yoga Shastra, Srimad Bhagavad Gita, which was spoken by Lord Sri Krishna himself to Arjuna and which is found in the Bhishma Parva section of the great epic, the Mahabharata, which was composed by the great sage Vyasadeva in 100,000 verses. Jai Srimad Bhagavad Gita ki Jai.